I just um, wanted to welcome everybody who's returning, who comes to Saturday Stories frequently, and I know there's a lot of you, and then any newcomers, uh, welcome. So I'm very thrilled today to have Erin Bennett Banks, who's joining us from Charleston, and I'll be telling you more about her shortly. And um, I just wanted to let you know a little bit more about Saturday Stories for those of you who are just joining. Uh, so Saturday Stories is our monthly program for families. Um, we focus on picture book illustrators. Some do their uh, writing and illustrating, uh, so they're author illustrators, and some are uh, more illustrators and illustrate with other authors. And um, today, this book that um, Aaron is going to be talking about was illustrated by her, but also written by um, Betty Stroud. So this is the book, and she's going to be sharing all of the artwork and how she did those illustrations. And for our workshop, she's going to be sharing how to do a storytelling patchwork illustration, which is going to be really fun. So I hope you have your materials handy. Um, so we've been doing this since 2018, and we used to run it actually live at the Museum of Illustration in Manhattan. But when the pandemic started last year, we um, decided, oh, let's try to do this as a webinar. And we started that in November. And it's been running so well, and we're thrilled to have participants from all over the world, which is very exciting. And we also upload this recording um, to our YouTube channel, so people can go and visit and have a look at the, um, the whole program at any time they would like. So also, I wanted to just make a note to you all about what's going on at the museum. We have several exhibits that are running. We have the Maurice Sendak illustrations and um, it's not just an exhibit but actually the artworks are for sale so that's very fascinating to go and take a look at Maurice Sandak's artwork he's everything is in there from small sketches to beautiful big artwork uh, for posters and all kinds of things that he's done with his books so you all know who he is right uh, where the wild things are okay and then we also have two um, exhibits from our permanent collection comic and cartoon works and also creatures so those are very fascinating to look at. And we have a brand new exhibit and that's up in our dining room. And that is um, the original works of James Montgomery Flagg. And you can read more about um, the details of these exhibits and register to get tickets to go and visit the museum online. And Lindsay, who is behind the scenes from the Society of Illustrators is going to put in the chat the uh, website link so that if you wanted to pop over there, you can just click on that link later and we just copy paste it and then look at um, those exhibits online. We also have two uh, more picture book illustration uh, events coming up right this week. So we have James Yang who's coming on June 23rd. He'll be talking about the process of how he made his book A Boy Called Isamu. And this is a fascinating book about the story of Isamu Naguchi who is a sculptor, fam famous Japanese sculptor. And so he's running that, I think it's from 6 to 7.30. So it's an early evening program, free, by the way, as is our Thursday program with Selena Alco and her book, I is for Immigrant, and it's an alphabet book. And she's going to be actually running a live workshop, pretty similar to the one we do for Saturday Stories. And that is in the afternoon afternoon from 3.30 to 4.30, also free. And speaking of free, I definitely want to give a shout out to the James, uh, sorry, to the Bruce J. Heim Foundation, who generously give a gift for us to be able to bring this program to you all for free. They, um, their, their belief is that books really do um, engage children, inspire children, influence children in their imaginations and their dreams. And we all believe in that too here. So I now, without further ado, you would like to now introduce to you Erin Bennett Banks. Hello, Erin. And so Erin is joining us from, as I said, Charleston, South Carolina, but she is actually a native of New York. And she's um, been down in the South since she went to do her master's degree in Savannah, Georgia at the school of um, Savannah School of Art. Very good school down there. And um, then she moved to Charleston, where she lives with her three girls and her husband, Tim Banks, who's also a talented and acclaimed illustrator himself, who also did a program for us at Saturday Stories live at the museum um, in 2020, before the pandemic, actually. So I um, am very happy to have Erin here. You know, I've been down in Charleston, as I mentioned, and I've worked with Erin and she's doing graphic design and all kinds of things at the museum. She's done books for the museum down here called the Gibbs Museum of Art. And she'll be talking a little bit more about that book that she did for the museum. 
And um, her illustrations, I just want to point out, are very unique. She has a very distinct, very cool illustration style, which I think you'll really enjoy seeing how she does that process. She's going to show you all how she does her artwork. And she has, uh, you know, really gained recognition for her illustrations. Her passion is to really work with books that tell stories of uh, culturally rich um, historical narratives. And this is one of those books, The Patchwork Quilt. So I now turn over our programming to Erin. Don't forget, when you do your artwork, please do send in your artwork, scan them, take a photo of them with the iPhone and send them to my email address, which Lindsay will pop into the chat. And also, Ask lots of questions. Erin will be delighted to answer any of your questions, which I will I will tell her what you're asking when she's doing her workshop. So we'll let her do her presentation. She'll start the workshop and then please feel free to ask all kinds of questions. I'll be very happy to answer them for you. Anyway, Erin, please take over. <laughs> Welcome. Well, thank you, Claire. And thank you to the Society of Illustrators for hosting this amazing series. I'm honored to be one of the illustrators that, um, that gets to share a little bit of my story and um, go through a workshop that hopefully will make it exciting and relevant to y'all. So as Claire mentioned, um, I am an illustrator and today's workshop is actually going to focus on a book, my first children's book actually that I illustrated and it's called The Patrick Path. And um, what I'm going to do as far as the format of today is I'm going to share a little bit of my story um, as an artist and talk a little bit about my process, um, show y'all um, uh, some different examples of work that I've done, um, some kind of behind the scenes in case anybody's curious about how a children's book is made or how illustrations work. And then um, we're gonna turn it around and give you all an opportunity um, to engage in a workshop that's focused on quilt patterns. Um, so I wanted to mention this now because if you don't have um, fun art supplies around you, you are welcome to go scramble and grab things while I'm chatting. Um, you really don't need anything fancy. This is all basic stuff. And if you just wanna watch, that's totally fine. Or if you just have a pencil and you wanna draw at the end, totally fine. Um, but if you wanna um, get involved and create something fun, I wanted to share a few things that would be helpful to have on hand. Um, first thing is some kind of drawing tool, like pencil, pen. Obviously, pencils are great because you can erase. Um, you might want to, you might want a ruler, um, especially if you're going to want to, you know, um, do anything precise. But again, optional. You don't have to use rulers. Some kind of glue or glue stick is handy. So I would say if you have those on hand, tape would work fine too. Maybe sta staples or something like that. Um, and then I um, actually have a bunch of markers here, like a little assortment of, these are Sharpies, but any kind of marker, crayon, colored pencil, um, scissors are great. You probably want to have scissors unless you're really good at tearing. <laughs> um, but the, really just basic um, materials. And then beyond that, paper. You do want to have some kind of paper. It can be ordinary, um, just copy paper. It can be wrapping paper. Um, it could be scrapbook paper, um, origami, magazine clippings, anything like that. Um, now, I am not necessarily a collage artist. I actually do all of my illustrations with paint, but in, um, for the sake of time, um, we're not doing a painting workshop because that would take hours to show you all that process. So um, without further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and jump into a little presentation that I've created and um, we'll kind of walk through there. I, um, as Claire mentioned, if you have questions, feel free to add them into the chat and following the presentation, um, she might share some of those questions. I actually can't see your faces. So I'm visualizing y'all out there in your creative spaces and hello and thank you for joining. Um, but I'm going to pretend I can see your faces. And um, again, like Claire said at the end, I do hope you'll share the work that you created because it just makes it cool to see what, um, what you're inspired by. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen here and we are gonna jump into the Patrick Path. All right, can y'all see? Good. Yes. So the Patrick Path. So this is me. Um, if you are curious about my work, um, you're welcome to um, check me out on my website, which is erinbanks.com. Easy to remember. I'm also on Instagram and Facebook. You can follow me at Art by Aaron Banks. So if you wanted to go back and look at some other samples or relook at some things, you're welcome to do that. And my contact info is on there too. So if you wanted to email me anything from the uh, workshop or any follow-up questions, I would love to hear from y'all. So please do if you are so inclined. Um, I'm actually going to go way back, way, way back. Um, this is a picture of me as a young child. That's me and my brother, actually. 
Um, as Claire mentioned, I am actually, I live in Charleston, South Carolina now, but I was born and raised in Rochester, New York. And um, I was very artistic. I'm sure many of you are. You wouldn't be here if you weren't. Um, and these are a few samples that my mom shared with me of um, works I did when I was a child. And I wanted to show this to you because I wanted to flip actually to a more current shot so you can actually see the um, my before, which I'll go back again here so you can see again, and my after. So you can see um, even as a child, I was interested in things like patterns, shape, repetition, stylizing, which is anytime you make a character and you maybe make it a little more interesting by um, simplifying the shapes. Um, these are some samples of illustrations that I've done for different books and um, this is for a magazine. And you can see I've incorporated a lot of patterns into the animals. This was actually from a book that I illustrated called The First Music. And um, it talked about the um, animals in Africa and the different patterns that they encountered were part of my illustration style. So I'm gonna hop forward here and you can see a few more um, samples of my working space. This is over the years. Um, I do actually a few different types of work for my illustrations. So I do oil paints, which is actually what I've used for the Patrick Pat. So these were actually all painted in oils. Um, I also do digital illustration. Um, the thing that is cool about digital is it's very user-friendly. So um, it's, a, it's a practical uh, medium to use. But the thing that's interesting about my style is that it translates both pretty seamlessly between oil and digital. So some of these pieces you probably won't even know if they're oil or digital, but I wanted to mention that in advance because a lot of times as artists, we get caught up on what materials we use and that doesn't necessarily have to be the case. There's a lot of artists that work in many different mediums um, and you might have one that you prefer. If you prefer watercolors, colored pencils, crayons, um, it's, this is a great time to experiment. So my advice to y'all, especially as young artists, is to go ahead and try everything because this is how you get to decide what you enjoy. Um, I love oils. Um, a lot of artists that are illustrators work in acrylics because it's a more practical medium. It dries a lot quicker, but I just like the creamy texture of oils. So that's um, one reason I do that, but it is um, probably not the most user-friendly medium for illustration. Uh, these are some of my um, in influences, um, people that, artists that inspire me. My favorites um, that I've always loved, I love Ezra Jack Keats. You probably know him from The Snowy Day. I love Leo and Diane Dillon. Ashanti Tezulu was very influential on me. Um, uh, it's just, their work is amazing. Um, I love, and you'll see, you can see in the work that I do, the use of patterns is consistent. Um, the use of um, stylizing characters, the use of getting into a story and really understanding a culture before you, you know, decide how you want to frame the work. Because the cool thing about being an illustrator is that you're a storyteller. So what we do, what makes illustration different than maybe like a fine artist is that we get to visually communicate what an author has written or what the story is about. And so it gives you total freedom. You don't have to draw things realistically if you don't want to. You can stylize, it can be literal, it can be completely conceptual. It really is up to you as the artist. So it's total freedom. Um, these are a few other um, influences. Modigliani, I just love the way he draws or drew people, women. Um, you'll see a lot of long necks in my work. I just I totally love him. And Romare Bearden is just amazing. Um, again, you'll see that the influence of collage, even though, as I mentioned, I'm not a collage artist, I definitely am inspired and influenced by, by um, other collage artists. Um, these are actually a few samples of paintings that I've done. And I wanted to start with this just so you can kind of get an understanding of my technique, because even though these are just landscapes, it's the same technique that I use when I paint people, places, whatnot. Um, I love square brushes. I think I have a few here to show you. Um, the reason all my work is kind of angular is because I love a good square brush. So I tend to use square brushes. I'm not a big fan of little round brushes. So I tend to paint in a very like geometric style. Um, another thing that I love to do, and I'm gonna share a little bit more um, from an illustration is I love to do underpaintings. And an underpainting is when you put a color or different colors underneath of um, what you're gonna build and you build on top, but you, can, you let some of the color peek through. So you can see actually in these, these little pink pockets are actually an underpainting. Um, and I'm gonna show you how I do this in an illustration. And the reason I'm mentioning it now is because this is a little trick you can use even when you create your quilt code or the quilt pattern that we're gonna work on a little bit later. So here's an illustration that I created for 
a local newspaper and it was actually illustrating a poem, um, a beautiful poem by the uh, poet laureate for South Carolina. And um, the way I built this illustration, actually it's, an, it's a digital illustration. I built it the exact same way I built a painting. So when I create a painting and uh, I don't know how, if you can see this, but I actually start with a, with a just a broad underpainting. So all I do is I take my canvas and I paint it and I do cool textures, mix match, doesn't have to be exact. And then I go in and I add the drawing. So it, whether if it's on canvas or whether it's digital, I go ahead and I kind of flesh out the drawing. Now there's probably a rougher drawing before this, but this is an example of a more finished drawing. Then I start to add color. So I like to start with the background um, or I don't know, it's, it really is whatever I'm interested in at the moment. But um, one thing I, also do that's like I guess a little trick is I like to use a limited palette so even though my work is very color oriented if you look closely I really only use maybe five to seven colors um the reason I do that first is because I'm a little lazy and so I like to I don't I don't like having a billion colors to choose from it's too stressful for me so what I the reason that's actually where I, why I started doing this but I also did it because I noticed the other artists that I really love printmakers um more, I guess, stylistic artists tended to do this or um, woodblock prints. If you look at woodblock prints, just beautiful use of strategic colors. So I'll usually pick a few colors and then I make myself figure out where I'm gonna put them and kind of like, how can I maximize these colors to get the most bang for their buck? Um, so I have very simple color palette, even though it is a very rich color palette. Um, here's an example where I added the foreground. So I've already got the background, which is basically the, all the things in the background, the, um, the landscape, the sky, what's behind the character. Foreground is what's in the front. So um, if you've learned this in your art class, you might learn that in the foreground, sometimes we put a little more detail there. Oftentimes, if it's a picture with a portrait, they might be your focus point. So I usually spend a little more time in the foreground and you'll see a little more detail, maybe a little more color or pattern tends to go more in the foreground. Um, and then the last part is I add texture. So this is the fun part. You can do this again um, digitally. You can do it with paint. You know, you can use it with different textures, whatnot. Um, and the thing that you'll notice, if you remember from the very beginning, is if you look real close, there's these little pockets of pink that are shining through. And really, all that that is is it's me not filling in the lines. So when you're coloring, if you you know are doing like a coloring book with lines. And you don't go to the edge, but you had a color underneath of it, it, it creates this really cool energy. So I love it when lines don't meet up. So that's something that you're going to see in a lot of my work. These are some early work. So I'm going to kind of flash through this more quickly. Um, but this is a series of kind of vintage inspired, uh, I call them my season ladies, my spring, summer, winter, fall ladies. And this is when I was kind of working out my style. I hadn't totally, um, I guess, nailed down what I wanted to be or how I wanted to work. But there are some similarities in these, which is why I'm sharing them. One is, again, that underpainting, that limited palette, um, these kind of stylized characters, which is, means really it's just very shape oriented. I love to design my characters. So I tend to stylize when possible. If I have something that I can break into shapes or patterns, I do that just because it's fun. Um, this is a series of tiny portraits, I call them. And these are also inspired by um, actual like vintage, um, vintage photographs. I love looking at old photographs and then vintage um, wallpaper. So wallpaper is amazing. Um, actually, you could use wallpaper if you have wallpaper today for your quilt patterns. But um, I love um, the interesting shapes and colors and patterns. So even if I don't put it in my work, I will sometimes look at wallpaper samples just for inspiration. Uh, these are some early editorial pieces that I created. Again, you'll see a lot of repetition, a lot of patterns you see here, like the sun with the rays, the palm tree with the, you know, the that stylized little pointy parts, um, the sense of motion. That's something that I do in a lot of my works, the limited colors. So again, if you look at each, each piece, there's only maybe five to seven colors that I'm using. They both have that pink underpainting. Um, and I guess this is a good time to mention too, um, those of you that are interested in illustration, these are actually pieces I created for a magazine. So when we say editorial illustration, what we're referring to is an illustration that was created for some kind of editorial piece. So it could be a magazine, a newspaper, um, I guess online, it could be a blog or something like that. But it's something that's um, typically a one time, usually for a, a magazine article, you might do one, maybe two or three illustrations, or you might do 
a big illustration and then a spot illustration, which is just like a little floating illustration. Um, so it's a little different than a children's book, which obviously entails usually more like 20, you know, ish finished paintings. Um, and that's a good segue to children's books. So The Patrick Path, which is the focus of today's workshop, was my first children's book. Um, as Claire mentioned in the beginning, it was written by Betty Stroud, and then I was the illustrator, and it was published by Candlewick Press. Um, the interesting thing about the process of illustration that I've learned, um, I um, have illustrated seven books. Actually, my seventh book is coming out uh, this fall. And um, the, the process, I think people typically think of it as a very collaborative process between artist and um, author, and it is, but it's not always you don't always necessarily interact with them during the process, or at least it hasn't been my experience. So in this case, the book was, or the, the story was already written. I worked a lot with the editor and the art director, but I did the pictures and the pictures came second. So sometimes people ask what comes first. Um, this isn't always the case. Obviously there's also author illustrators that do both, in which case you can do it any order you want. But in my experience, the book came first, the publisher then, tried to find an artist who matched the story. So that is actually the reason why I was chosen for all of these books. So all of these books were projects where the publisher contacted me because they had seen my work somewhere else and they felt like it was a good match for their story. So um, these date back to 2005 is when I illustrated the Patrick Path. So that was about, gosh, 16 years ago. And then um, it trails up through um, my book that I just mentioned that's being published um, this fall by InterVarsity Press. So I'll have a few samples um, later of these books, but these are all individual book projects. So they're a little bit more intensive than the, the editorial works that I just showed you. These are a handful of illustrations from The First Music, which was my second book or third, second or third book that I illustrated. I had mentioned in the beginning um, it is a story about the animals in Africa and the origin of music and how the animals all come together and um, learn how to uh, create music together, work together. And um, it's all about including the frogs who feel like they don't belong. Um, and you'll see in here, again, I, I included this because the, the use of patterns. So when I was creating these characters, I looked at obviously uh, examples of the different animals, but then I went a step further and I researched um, animal, or I, I researched patterns in Africa that I could incorporate into the character. So you'll see that each character has little elements, whether it's a necklace or the pattern on their scale. I love it if there's something like, you know, animals have their own natural patterns. So whether it's the scales on their back or something on their feathers, when you can take something that is real and then actually stylize it to make it just a little bit more interesting. And I'm gonna show you here kind of my process of how I draw. This is a time-lapse drawing. I did it for another workshop actually that was focused on the first music. And you can see when I'm drawing, it's very shape-oriented. This is just with the Sharpie markers, nothing fancy, but it's very linear. I use a lot of, of, of sharp lines, a lot of you know blocked in areas. So that's a good example. Of, um, I don't draw that fast. That's a time lapse. <laughs> <laughs> that would be amazing. <laughs> yeah, I, you would have really good productivity if you could draw that fast. Um, but that's a good example. I, I thought that might help so you could see when I draw. I literally am, I almost think of it as like I'm sculpting these little characters. Like I'm kind of creating this three dimensional space. And I love, I love illustrations and books where there's this tension between 2D and 3D. So what I mean by that is like, there's this 2D world, which is just flat, you know, shapes, characters, but there's also this 3D world that they live in and there's this kind of back and forth. So you'll find that that's something that I try to, oops, try to do a lot. Uh, this is from a book that I um, worked on with Nimbus Publishing. They're actually based in Nova Scotia and um, it is um, actually a historical fiction story. And I included it, I wanted to share it with y'all just so you could see that even though the focus of this story was more of a, of a biography, um, so it, was, it had a lot of characters and a narrative to it, but um, even here I employ those same elements of pattern. So you'll see kind of repetition, the, the use of color, I'm, I'm a very limited palette, I'm including it kind of, I'm designing the page with pockets of color in different spots. Um, things like clouds, you know, are done in a very angular way. I've got a sense of shape to everything. So even in my figurative work, I use a lot of the same elements. 
Uh, this is an editorial piece or illustration I did for Skirt Magazine about, um, it's actually a really interesting story about the, um, it's called Global Foodways and the different, uh, the history of um, women in the kitchen and how it in, has influenced cultures and that's historically been a meeting place for them. And it's, it's actually really interesting. It also talked a lot about the history of in art, like Renaissance art, the the table and um, whatnot, but it's, it's really fascinating. I always love to read stories before I illustrate them, which obviously you should because you're telling the story. So usually that's the first thing I do before I even work on a piece is I read whatever the story is. Now, this is another example I wanted to share with you of how as an illustrator, you know, you're not limited to just doing books and magazines. This is actually a, a piece I did um, for um, a public art project um, here in Charleston. Um, it's a um, traffic box wrap. And you see a lot of towns doing these kind of beautification projects with benches and traffic mm -hmm. box, you know, just make them a little prettier. So, um, but it was fun doing this piece. And I've done a few wraps like this because I had to think three dimensionally about, you know, this piece that would wrap around a, a four paneled, um, you know, box. And so I had to think not in terms of just the individual boxes, but how it would flow in a circle. So it's always fun as an artist, when you can do something that, um, you know, that takes you out of the typical realm. As illustrators, we tend to work very small. We tend to, in fact, I think it's interesting. Most illustrators tend to, um, you know, have like their little like, um, cave that they work in and their little tools and they work small and we're all very like kind sweet introspective people not I mean I guess most are and um I I find it interesting the um, personality traits of illustrators versus maybe other types of artists um but um but it is fun when we have to break out of our shell so here's another breaking out of my shell moment um where I did a um, illustration that was actually used for an exhibition panel so this um uh, exhibition at the Gibbs Museum of Art was for um, a really cool show about the art of Porgy and Bess, which has a backstory and um, actually um, relates to Charleston, which is one reason why it debuted here. Um, and you can see to scale, these are some um, pictures of me. This was a few years ago. Um, so that was during the baby years. But you can see the um, actual uh, piece was reproduced at six by nine. Now, I didn't paint it six by nine. It was blown up to that size. But um, but it is really fun because, again, when you're thinking more big scale, you have to, you know, rethink how you approach an illustration. Um, this piece, I, you probably saw in the very beginning, this was actually a cover piece I did for a local um, newspaper. And um, I love theater, so I, I love any chance I can do that incorporates music or theater. I think the arts, we all love you know, each other. <laughs> um, so I think that um, it's very natural to incorporate that into our work. And again, I included it because I wanted you all to see limited palette, really just yellows, oranges, that pink underpainting is poking through and that pattern. So I love when you have a crowd scene or anything with like a lot of detail, I think it's really cool when artists just do like monotone, which means, you know, one color or like two colors and just keep it real simple. And it, it just, it almost takes the faces and, and it turns it, you can look at them as faces, but you could also look at them as just shapes and patterns. It's like when you see those trick um, patterns where the, you look at a picture and they're like, can you find the penguin? And you just see the shapes and you don't know what you're looking at. It's, I love that idea that how your mind is trying to figure it out or it can just look at it as a beautifully designed piece. So, um, and again here, the foreground, the characters in the front, a little bit more detail, a little darker palette because they're supposed to be shadowed. So that's um, some little tricks that my husband actually does that really well in his work. If you, Timothy Banks um, illustration, if you look him up, his uh, he's really, really good at the foreground stuff. I, I kind of stole that from him. <laughs> um, <clears throat> this um, book actually um, created this two to three years ago. Uh, and it was it was a really fun project because I designed it as well as illustrated it. So I got to have total control, which is always fun because sometimes you lose that control and, you know, that can be a bummer if, <laughs> if you don't have total control. But this one I did, um, it is called G is for Gibbs, a museum ABC book. And the concept is really cool. It is actually an ABC book that uses um, Art, it, it tells the ABC through artwork in the museum. So in this case, in, in the Gibbs Museum of Art, it walks you through the process the process of visiting an art museum and just different terms that you might encounter because we're not all familiar with all the terms, um, but in the alphabet 
order. So it's it's a really fun piece. And in this story, I had this um, gator. I have a lot of alligators in my work, which is kind of funny that I ended up in Charleston because, you know, we, we, we live around alligators. So um, it's only fitting. But in this story, he's the protagonist. He's the main character. And he's the one that walks you through the, um, the story. And here um, I wanted to show you before and after um, just so you can see, because it's always fun to see what came first. So in this case, I obviously had some rougher sketches first, but these are my finished drawings. And then here, voila, you add color and you have your final illustration. And in this case, I also have the text. So the text comes last. Um, so when you're an illustrator, you don't, I don't personally add the text, except in this case, because I designed it. So this is an exception, but in the case of things like the Patrick Path, my only goal was to make the pictures. However, you always have to be thinking about text. So you always have to give a place for the designer to put text. So when I create an illustration, I always try to have like an area, like a blank area where I'm thinking they're gonna wanna put the text here because I love designers. So I wanna make them happy. And as a designer, I also know the pain of having to put text on a piece that doesn't have a space for it. Um, so I always try to have a zone where text can be placed either a dark zone or light zone or just a place where that's a little bit more empty um, because that helps with the flow of the book. The other thing I always like, I remember when I was in grad school studying illustration um, and looking at books, I love creating a sense of motion. So left to right, I always love to think about when you're looking at a book, you wanna flip the pages and you wanna create this movement. And so in a lot of my works, I try to create it so the movement goes left to right and it takes you to the next page. And then I love, and actually it's, um, Marie Sendak is a great um, example and where the wild things are. And y'all have probably looked at this, but when the wild rumpus is happening and it builds and it builds. And, and then in the beginning, there's this like amazing full page spread, which is just a spread is the two pages together. And it's just the wild rumpus and it's amazing. And then it kind of starts to taper down a little bit by a little bit. And I love that build. So anytime I can in a book, I love to think about what's my wild rumpus. Like what's, what page can I make be like the grand, you know, with all the animals together, whatnot. And I love it when you can do that in a book because it just, it creates kind of a rhythm to the story. Um, this is, um, the, these are actually products that were created from the, the Gibbs ABC book. So there's some coloring pages that were created from it. These are masks. Obviously last year was a great year for masks for illustrators because <laughs> it was a, everybody wanted to buy them. So these are some masks that we created for the museum. Um, and um, that's just to show you that, you know, again, the fun thing about creating, you know, books is you can also use the um, pictures for products. Um, and then this is my last book that I just finished about a month ago and it's um, being released this fall. And it was a project I worked on with InterVarsity Press in Chicago. And these are a sneak peek of um, some of the illustrations. It's a really beautiful story. And it, um, it piggybacks a little bit on Martin Luther King and um, his message. And it talks about um, diversity and inclusion and celebrating and bringing together all cultures. And um, it's right on point with everything I love to put in my books. For as long as I've illustrated, I've always gravitated towards stories where there is um, this inclusion of cultures, where there's an exploration of maybe a, another culture story or an interpretation. Um, and so for me, this was really fun to work on because I got to do all those things. And obviously I got to do all my tricks, which is the, you know, the pink and the undertones and the colors and the speckles. So it, it really um, suited me very well. Um, so I'm actually gonna um, dive into the Patrick Path um, a little bit more deeply. And this is where um, I'll give you a little hint. So when we, um, when I'm done kind of walking through this part, if you did want to work on the workshop portion of this, um, what we're going to do is we're actually going to create our own quilt code. So this um, little uh, uh, pattern you see here, that's a, a quilt code. Um, obviously quilts are, um, made out of fabric typically, but we're talking, we're, we're gonna use paper. Unless you have fabric, you could do this with fabric. Actually, that would be really cool if anyone wants to do that. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the process of making this children's book because it relates to the workshop. And it also gives you a little bit more insight into that behind the scenes process. So in this book, the driving force is this uh, idea of a quilt code. And basically the quilt code is just that. It's a collection of, patterns that are symbolic and each pattern 
represents something different that's really important to the story. So the patterns, um, this, this code is introduced in the very beginning of the book and it actually um, is going to help, it's almost like chapter headings. Each page walks you through the different patterns and tells the story of the character. Uh, so these patterns, if you, when we come to the workshop portion, want to focus on one of these patterns, you're more than welcome to do that. Having said that, you don't have to, you can do your own patterns and we're gonna talk a little bit about that as well, but I wanted to kind of give a heads up on that. When I was illustrating this book, um, again, I mentioned my first step is always research. Um, I'm the type of artist I need to research something to kind of get into the world before I can start drawing. I just am not good at coming up with stuff out of my head. Some artists are really good at that. I know I mentioned my husband, we're very different in our approaches. He is really good at coming up with just these amazing characters. And I think it comes from years of drawing during church. <laughs> so he would just draw, draw, draw. And he's just a really talented draw drafter. And I'm the type of person that I need to see something first before I can kind of get my inspiration. Um, so because this book was about quilts, I also spent a lot of time looking at quilts, which is just, I mean, that's just fun to do. Um, anybody that loves pattern or design, symbols. Um, quilts are amazing. So these are some of the different quilts that I researched um, when I was working on the book. Um, I actually scanned a few samples of my early notes. So I um, I took notes when I, um, this book, The Patrick Path, was actually based on a, a, a book, an actual chapter book that was written that was um, basically a, a retelling of a story that happened in real life actually here in Charleston, even though I didn't live in Charleston at the time. So it's kind of funny that I ended up here. Um, but um, so I read the book before I did this children's book, which is based on the book. That's a lot of information. Not every children's book has that kind of backstory, but I did a lot of research um, and I took notes. The, when you're creating a book, the first step is always to think about the big picture. For me, at least it is. So I, um, as I read the story, so the story that Betty Stroud, the author, wrote, um, usually as an illustrator, when they give you the story, it's given to you in a manuscript that's uh, called a paginated manuscript. And what that means is the story is broken into the pages. So it might say page four to five, and then it has a paragraph, and then I'll say page you know six to seven, and then it has another like whatever words are going to be on that spread. And then you typically think of it in one spread at a time. So as I mentioned, a spread is the two, the, the left and right pages together. So you typically think of each spread because in a lot of cases, an illustration will be a full spread. I prefer to work that way. Some books are beautiful and don't have the full, or will just be like one side or might be spot illustrations throughout. So there's totally different ways. And then now that you know that you might wanna look at books and kind of like think, oh, is this one picture? Or is this two separate pictures? Or is this a picture with like a border? It's, it, there's all, there's no right or wrong way. But I always like to think of it in terms of the full spread. Um, and then, um, so if you go back, so here's the rough, um, super rough. I always use a pen. I make myself use a pen because I don't wanna go back and get in a race. I want it to be as, as rough and raw as I can. Um, and then from there, I come up with thumbnail sketches. So they're called thumbnail sketches because they're just that. They're just tiny little sketches you do. And the whole point of this, it's the idea of creating a sloppy first draft where you, um, come up with as many ideas as you can to tell the same story. So if you look at this, this is actually one spread in the book. In fact, it's the page. If you all, for those of you that have read the Patrick Path, there's a scene where um, the girl Hannah is, uh, she takes this quilt. It's not the, the quilt that we're gonna talk about in the story, but she has the quilt here that has this monkey wrench pattern and she's airing it out. And then and the reason why is in the story, that symbol is sp supposed to be a, um, it's a symbol to everybody that, hey, we're going we're gonna to get ready to, well, I'll tell you the story in a little bit, but it's a symbol. So that's all you need to know at this point is that she's shaking out this quilt. And so my job as an illustrator is to think of what's the most dramatic way I can show that. And so if you look at all these thumbnails, it's telling the exact same page. It's just different ways. Do I have her in the window? Is it a close-up of her? Do you see other workers in the field while she's doing it? And I zoomed back. Is this, are we going to create something worth the characters looking in? So these are all different ways that I could have approached it. And so what I did is I created all of those. I narrowed it down to my favorite. Sometimes you share them with the editor. I don't like to share it unless I really, really like it. So I, I don't know. I might have at the time shared one or two, but I definitely picked my favorite ones. And then from there, you do a more detailed drawing. So in this case, I actually worked with models. Um, to help me 
draw the characters. You don't always do that. And you definitely don't have to do that as an illustrator. Um, but for this book, I did. Uh, and so when I was creating these character studies, which basically a character study is that you take your main characters and you kind of flesh out what they're going to look like. And maybe you practice different emotions on their faces, different you know poses. So I actually worked with a, um, a young model and she posed for me in different ways that would help me to think about how I wanted the character to look. Um, I'm also looking at, you know, old uh, photographs. Um, I love to always look at costumes or um, jewelry, hairstyles, anything that is going to help inform it. It's really important if you're doing a book that's a historical fiction book because you have to make sure that it's accurate. You don't want to have, you know, somebody, you know, with like a cell phone that is in a book that was supposed to happen in the 1800s. Or, I mean, that's, you know, or you, you need to make sure that it's true to the story. So um, that's another thing I'm always thinking about. So here's the, um, the father character. So the Hannah is the main character and her father, those are the two main characters in the story. Um, here are some additional samples, not from the Patrick Path. This is actually from the first music, the book I've been talking about with the animals. And I just wanted to share it so you could see different examples of character studies. So we do character studies even for animals. Um, it could be for an object, it's whatever your main characters are. And again, it's kind of like a little cheat sheet you're creating so that when you actually dive in to do the illustrations, you have this little reference of what the characters look like. And it's your chance to work out the kinks. So um, I, this is where I practice, how do I want the patterns to work? What kind of personality do I want them to have? If they were turned this way or that way, what would they look like in flight or whatnot? So it's just a good practice to do so that you're consistent because you wanna make sure your character is consistent from the very beginning to the very end. Um, I don't do that 100% perfectly. There's a few pages in this book that I actually secretly don't like because I didn't do a good job of that, but a good children's book will. Um, and here's some more character studies from a, a book um, concept that I worked on with a publisher um, about Little Red Riding Hood. And again, so main character, different expressions, different poses, just working it out. And here you can see it come together. So here's where I had my reference photos from the models I was working with. The sketch, so this is kind of my final sketch that I, I did. I think in this case, I drew it and then I might have brought it into Photoshop uh, into the computer and kind of like repositioned it. That's a great way you can use technology even if you're doing traditional work to help you get it just right. Because I always want it to be like the best possible version. And then here you can see what it looks like in the final painting. So this was a, again, an oil painting. So that would have been my process. Um, again, here's another example where I did that. I actually, um, I went and found a quilting club and um, they let me sit in and watch them create um, so quilts and that was really a really cool experience and for this book it was important because I wanted to kind of get the feeling the energy of um, making a quilt because I'm not a quilter I, I'm not um, I you know so I, I can't pretend to be so I have to you know learn from other people so there I any chance you can do that it's just going to make the authenticity of your book that much better so here you can see the sketch this is actually the opening spread of the book with Hannah and her mom and they're making this quilt code and here you can see the final uh, painting. In this case, I think I was playing around with a, a yellow underpainting. So um, I didn't discover pink till maybe a little into the story, but, um, but it's the same process. And here's a few more finished illustrations. And um, I wanted to share these because these are all pieces where you can see the quilt code. So um, the code that you saw with those different patterns, I actually kind of created a little mock quilt as my reference. And throughout the story, this quilt is um, a piece that Hannah, the character, is going to take with her on the journey. And so um, this actually um, is a little deceiving. This, this is actually just a monkey wrench quilt. So it's not the quilt code. The quilt code has all the different, like the nine or I forget how many different patterns. This one is just monkey wrench. Um, but you can see how I uh, translated it through paint. So here's the actual um, quilt code. And if you've read the book, this is actually, you'll know this is the final illustration. And this is a spot illustration. I mentioned in the beginning, um, a, a spot illustration is when it's just a, a solo drawing or painting or, you know, but it usually doesn't, it's not fit to a square necessarily. It's usually like a little spot on a page. So that's what that is. We have to create your own personal quilt, um, quilt pattern. And again, using the materials that you want. I, um, I have some samples and actually, um, if you, and actually I should just, I'll go through this really quickly. These are some samples. I'm not gonna talk because obviously <laughs> I could talk too long. These are actually samples of other quilts from different cultures that I thought were really interesting. And actually the one right that I just 
flew through too quickly. This is a, um, a quilt from 1886 by Harriet Powers, and it's a Bible quilt. And I wanted to show this to you because each square has a narrative. So we're so used to seeing these quilts that are just patterns and um, symbols. But what's really cool about this old quilt was it actually told these stories of the Bible um, through these symbolic characters. And I want to mention that because that's actually what I'm thinking you may want to do in your own quilt code is to actually have these patterns that represent your life. Um, here are some more examples, Appalachian quilts, um, Native American quilts. So quilts are, I mean, there's so many cultures that have used quilts for years. Crazy quilts, that's the idea that you use patterns from all different scraps. Um, the quilts of G's Bend, if you're not familiar with them, definitely check these out. These are some gorgeous oh, quilts. Yeah. And the museum world um, discovered them uh, several years ago. And so there's been this kind of traveling um, show of these amazing quilts. And it's interesting. I think it's what the first time that this idea of looking at, um, at craft in a museum setting and looking at it as art um, in a different way than it typically has been looked at. So that's a whole nother workshop. <laughs> that's a whole other story. <laughs> um, so as I mentioned, um, uh, the, the supplies you want, basic art supplies, um, you've got it there. Um, the inspiration, it can be the quilt code that we just talked about, especially if there's a certain one that you liked or if you just need a starting point. Um, and I'll show you an example of that. Um, or um, you can make your own. It really doesn't matter. This is your quilt, it's your story. Um, you may want to pre-cut shapes. I guess I should have told you that in the beginning. So <laughs> if you do this again, um, you may want to go ahead and cut up pieces of paper just to speed up the process, but you know, you can do it on the fly. I actually did this experiment um, with, I have three girls and uh, <laughs> they, they were my guinea pigs. So we actually did this process together and I wanted, I actually um, wanted to show you how different the quilts all looked. So I showed them the quilt patterns and I don't know if any of them actually followed the instructions, but they all <laughs> created their own unique patterns. Um, and you can see they used um, paper, they drew on top of it, they scribbled, these were different ages. So some were a little more detailed than others. Um, some put little drawings inside of the quilt pattern. You might wanna do that too, if you want to. And um, definitely at the end, share your creation. Um, I, I know, I know um, if you could share it with Claire. I don't know, Claire, did you um, include an email they can send it to you? Or yes, you Lindsay put that in the chat, yeah. Oh, perfect, okay. We can um, share yeah. each other. So if you get some, you can send to me if I get perfect. some, I'll send to you. <laughs> yeah, so share it to both of us if you want to, but we'd love to see what you create. Um, and um, oh, that's the end of the presentation. Yeah, you're gonna share your hands working now. <laughs> yes, so <laughs> hopefully y'all can see. Yeah, we need to highlight that. So let's highlight your hand so that's big. Perfect. This is our bird's eye view of what I'm looking at. So I'm just going to kind of flip through some samples just to show you what your end piece might look like, but doesn't have to. Um, the one thing that I think will make it easy is if you have a piece of paper, it's helpful if it's a square. So if it's not a square yet, you might want to cut it into a square. This page is probably, I don't know, 12 by 12, 16 by 16. Um, but a square piece is a good starting point because um, most quilts are, you know, based on squares. And I just want to flip through so you can see here's, um, these are actually in the presentation. You can see that in these cases, the artist uh, put the paper down, but then went back in with marker. And um, that's something that you might want to do um, as well. You can see there's a mixture of pattern pieces and blank colors. Some of the colors relate to each other, some don't, that's perfectly fine. Um, this one, if you look a little closer, you can see little like drawings. Like I think that might be a portrait of mommy and daddy, I'm guessing, because <laughs> I see a beard. Um, so this is a more narrative one that I think my youngest daughter might have created um, to tell a story. Um, this was a more recent one that my um, oldest daughter did where she actually did try to do, this is the monkey wrench pattern and here's the, um, flying geese pattern. So um, she's using, she, we discovered some shiny paper. Here's a very basic quilt. Oops, I don't have to flip it. <laughs> you can all see what I'm looking at. This is a very basic quilt that just has a story on it. So um, again, it doesn't matter. It, it's really based on what is interesting, what piqued your interest. But what I do want us all to do, and I'm going to actually just go ahead and, um, and work on my own version at the same time. So you can kind of follow along if you want to, or just go ahead and, and start working on your own. Um, but I'll show you um, the way that I would um, do it for myself. So I'm gonna start with a blank piece of paper. 
And I'm actually going to divide it into four quadrants. So that just means into four um, sections. If you're real precise, you can measure it, but you don't have to be that precise unless you really want to. If, if you're working with origami squares, you might want to be a little more precise. But I'm just going to divide it into four squares. I'm using a pencil. Um, you can use a marker though, it doesn't matter. Actually, you might not even be able to see the pencil. So I am going to use a marker. I'll use purple. Um, so, and actually, you know, I'm not even going to outline that. What I'm going to do instead is um, I'm going to treat each square as its own section. So um, what you might want to do is this is a good time to decide if you're going to draw your, your quilts or if you're going to start with a piece of paper. Um, I am actually going to create a quilt that represents me. So what I'd love to do is if you want to create your own quilt that is, think of it as like a self-portrait. That's kind of what we're doing. We're creating self-portraits that tell your story. So um, you have four squares here. Each square can represent something different. It might be your family. It might be where you live. Maybe it's something you like. Maybe there's a hobby or a, um, an interest you have. Maybe it's a pet. Um, maybe you want to do a quilt that's, you know, about summertime, where you're going to travel this summer, um, things you like, um, if you play an instrument. So um, what I would love you to do is to think about four different things that represent you. And again, if you don't want to do this and you just want to do the quilt patterns, I'll, I'll touch on that afterwards as well. But I wanted to do this first because it's kind of fun to think about. And in the story, the quilts were used to, to tell a story. They were used to tell, um, you know, to, to, they were symbolic. So in a sense, um, the idea of symbolism is something that we can all do when we're making our artwork. So I'm actually going to create a quilt that is um, based on my family. So as I mentioned, um, my family is myself, my husband, who's an illustrator, and then we have three daughters. So it works out perfectly. I'm going to put us in one corner and each girl is going to get her own square. So um, if you don't want to draw, you could just use shapes if you want to. That's fine too. Um, I'm actually going to probably start with, actually, no, I'm going to start with my daughters. So my oldest daughter, her name is Ava Rose. I'm actually going to draw a rose. And you can't see this right now because it's a pencil. And I'm actually doing that on purpose because I don't want to mess up on the, on the workshop. But um, I am going to outline it in marker so you can see. So when I draw, I, I the quilts are perfect for me because I already like to draw in shapes. So I'm actually going to draw my rose in terms of shapes. Um, and again, I'm picking a rose because her name is Ava Rose. And so it's kind of perfect for symbolism. So I'm actually going to draw, and you are welcome to take your time. I'm gonna to try to rush through it more quickly just so I can cover more territory, but here's my rose, a little swirl in there, um, give it a stem. So this is gonna be her corner and I'm gonna go back later. What I'm gonna do, I love um, when I'm making these to kind of work circularly. So I might you know, do a rough drawing on each one and then come back. And I'm actually creating this with the idea that I'm going to go back in and add some patterns. But for right now, maybe I want to add a little bit of pattern just with marker. So I'm going to create this um, texture. And what's cool with patterns is you can use line, you can use dots, you can use shade in entirely to create contour. So maybe I space out my lines a little bit more on this part here. And you see what you're doing is I'm, I'm filling in each plane. This one I'm going to make a little more curvy. And it creates this sense that I'm filling it in. So if you if you're wanting to just draw your own quilt, this is a great option. If you are like, I want to cut paper because this, this is a quilting workshop, um, we are going to do that too. So maybe I want to make the stem be paper. Um, if the paper you're working with is thin enough to actually see through your lines, you actually could do that. Another little way that you can cheat. Oh, it's not a cheat, but it's just a way to help. I sometimes will take just real thin, like copy paper, and I'll, or you know, you can do this with tracing paper. I'll kind of trace over the shape that I want, and I'm going to use this as my template. And I'm just showing you all this, just because this is an easy way. If you're the type of person that gets frustrated because you want it to be the right shape, I mean, you might be able to just guess and get the right shape, and that's totally fine too. But I am, um, if I want the shape to kind of fit in that leaf pattern, then what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to use the paper, say I kind of created a uh, pattern. I'm going to... So whilst you're um, 
cutting there, Erin, I have a question. Um, yeah. George has asked, when you illustrate a book, are you also responsible for the type, position, placement, font, et cetera? So what is your role as the illustrator in relationship yeah. to the um, text? That's a great question. So typically, no. So typically when I'm hired to work on a, a book project, I'm just illustrating it, which means I only do the, um, the pictures. The only exception to that, well, I still think about the text um, because I know that I need to leave a place for the designer. And sometimes the editor or the art director will actually send you kind of a rough version and they'll say, I'm going to put text here. You know, so sometimes they actually tell you in advance once they've seen your sketches. But I don't typically put the text in unless it's a case like I know I mentioned that um, G is for Gibbs, the Museum ABC book. Um, that was unique because I actually designed that. And I'm actually a designer as well as an illustrator. So I designed the book as well. So that's the only time that I've ever actually placed the text in. And every other instance, um, I, um, I don't typically do the, the text. That's actually the, the graphic designer is the last kind of piece of the puzzle that will take all of the, the paintings you've done scan them in, or if they're digital, they'll take that and then they'll go in and add the text. Usually they'll use a program like um, Adobe InDesign or Illustrator is, where, is a good, both good programs that you might add that to. But if you're someone that wants to make your own book from start to scratch, then you would want to add your words, but that would come last. I would do that at the end. Right. right. That's great. Yeah, I'm glad. Ask questions. I forgot to encourage y'all. If you have questions, definitely chat in the, um, and Claire will pick out a few to share and I can ch uh, chat while yeah, I'm uh... And if you've got some, because we can't see you, if yeah. you've got some ideas of the sort of stories that you might be um, including in your quilt design, your patchwork design, um, let us know. Let us know if you're doing something about family or you're, you've got some patterns. We'd love to hear what you're doing, but ask questions if you have any related to anything, to illustration or, um, yeah in the patchworks you know so yeah do do write in I, I agree yeah so if um i would love to know if if you're you know how many of you are doing or have decided you're going to work on a quilt right now that's based on your family or based on you know an animal or based Pet. on <laughs> yeah how many of you were wanting to do the patrick quilt I, i'll try to um I'll, I'll try not to spend too much time on this um i'm actually wanting to show you if um actually you know because i don't want to lose time i'm going to show you some of the other quilts so um the next uh square i'm going to illustrate i'm actually going to do for my youngest daughter her name is isadora but her middle name is sarah so she's actually named after a bird we love birds and flowers so all of our children are named after birds or flowers so i'm actually going to draw a little sparrow and i'm going to use a different color and i'm going to but you know what's cool is when you draw, especially for this purpose, you can draw very basic shapes because think about that you might want to add paper on top. So in this case, I'm drawing a little bird. Now she would be perfectly fine just like this, or I might want to find some cool pattern. I actually um, have these little, found this little scrap um, patterns. These are great because they're just like ready-made. I don't know if you can see, actually you can't even really see on the camera, see there's like a little yeah, strip there. Yeah. Um, and I'm actually going to draw the wing. So here's a good example where you might want to mix and match. So you can actually take your scrap paper and cut it out. And again, what's cool is it doesn't have to be precise. In fact, one thing that you could do, which maybe I'll do that for the next one, the next square. And you can also work on your square separate. So like if you have a little, if you don't want to commit to the page, do your square on a own separate thing, create everything you want, and then at the end, glue it down. And yeah. that is a great way, especially if you don't want, if you want to do maybe six or seven and then pick your favorite ones, um, that would be a really cool way to, to, to work on it. Um, I probably would do that if I had more time, I probably would do it that way. So here I just made that little scrap pattern. Um, and you know, another thing I, I think I might do in this case for the bird is I would love to put a background pattern. So I'm just gonna kind of really loosely sketch out my bird. And this pattern, I'm gonna grab a, uh, let's see here, grab some paper, like a pink, she loves pink. 
So again, remember colors are symbolic too. So you might want to also choose your colors based on if you have a favorite color or maybe each, maybe it's a mood um, quilt and each um, square represents a different mood or emotion. That would be a really cool thing that you could do if you had, um, you know, different colors, different um, emotions or things that make you happy or sad um, that, that, you know, I know a lot of times people do kind of mood boards or inspiration mm -hmm. boards. This would be another great way, just like a different way of thinking about that. And so what I just did, I created, so I created a positive shape because here's my little bird. So I could, if I wanted to build on top, although I already put the wing down, or you could take the negative shape and the negative is what I just created and actually create, see how ready-made that makes it. And actually, this is a good a good reason that if you were, and I'm going to do this for my next one. Um, have you ever noticed when you're drawing, if you start with a color, like if you use a toned paper, um, it just makes you feel like you've accomplished so much when you draw on like a color of paper as opposed to drawing on white paper because you feel like you've like done half the work. So that's one little trick I love to do. So I'm actually going to do that for my third square. So this square is my middle child. Her name is Magnolia. So hers is an easy one to obviously draw because I shouldn't say it's easy to draw, but it's easy to symbolize because um, the Magnolia flower is so beautiful that um, I can actually draw. And again, I'm doing it in pencil first because I know if I do it in marker, I'll jinx myself and it'll come out looking funny. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but you might be braver than I am. Actually, let me grab that. Oh, you did a good job with Rose. <laughs> she was done in <laughs> marker. That's good. <laughs> And, you got, and I got to make sure the magnolia looks different than the rose because they are their own unique flowers. So I'm going to do, oh yeah, go ahead, Claire. No, I was just thinking of another thought for everybody, you know, interested in doing collage. If you collect wrapping paper, you know, don't throw wrapping paper yeah. out. When you unwrap a gift, um, just save that paper, you know, because you can definitely use it for scrapping, uh, you know, doing all the um, mm -hmm. collaging that you might want to do in the future. This wrapping paper has some very good patterns and textures and colors. Um, even aluminum foil, that could be something you could use. Yeah, something shiny. Yeah, things that you might have around the house, you know, that you could use as well, magazines. Um, yeah. Well, that's interesting that you mentioned that because I we had, this week was the last week of school here, so I wrapped all the teacher gifts and I had, I actually have, in fact, I can show you all, had scrap wrapping paper here. So actually, this is cool because look, if you have, um, I didn't even think of that. I could have cheated on the Magnolia one. If you have wrapping paper that has like an object or a design, like in this case, it has a flower, why not put that in your quilt? So what about that? Isn't that cool? Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. And add that. Um, another thing that um, I like to do when I'm making these, and I'm kind of jumping all around, but um, I love to add borders. So when I can, and let me find a different color, um, I... Um, Let's see here, I, my space is a little crazy right now. I'm gonna get this green, I have this green paper here. Um, and partly because it's just, it's a quick way to feel like you've made good progress. But um, what you might wanna do is think about, you know, either in the beginning or you could, this is something you could do at the very end too, just to give it the sense of a quilt. Because um, when people create quilts, quite often they do create the individual squares separately and then the quilt process is actually joining the squares together so if you think of that in terms of paper you can do the exact same thing so see what I'm doing I'm just cutting these strips of paper and they don't even have to match but just by doing that I've created the sense of cohesion and I probably do one actually to do one in the middle too and if you wanted to think of this finished quilt as, you know, um, maybe you want to have another symbolic in the middle, you could even take like a smaller square. I've got these little, there's, you can get all different sizes of origami paper, which is, I love because it's, you know, it's thin and it's workable. And maybe you do a quilt and maybe you turn it, like maybe you do like a little, um, create your own little pattern. And then you take like a smaller one, you do this, and then maybe you draw like a little symbol, maybe because this is my family, I maybe want to draw like a heart or something like that right in the middle. 
So um, I'm actually gonna, I'm, I'm, if I have time, I'll come back and draw myself and my husband, but I wanna show you real quick too, for those of you that did wanna do the, the quilt code, which if you remember, this is the quilt code. I just wanna show you a little example of how you might go about doing that. Um, and I'm actually gonna start with the same process. I'm gonna set my little autobiographical quilt that I didn't glue down. Make sure you glue it down. That Don't follow my lead on that one. Um, but I'm, it's the same process as that, and that I'm going to start with the squares and I'll try to pick some of the um, easier. And so you can see, I'm gonna go ahead and divide my quadrant into four. And um, I think, um, why don't we do the flying geese pattern? Because we talked a little bit about that. So for the flying geese pattern, I'm going to grab some different scrap paper. Um, I'm going to draw it out first. Just for me, it's easier to kind of draw it out. Um, and I am going to, well, I, you know, I'm going to do it on a piece of paper because I think that we can, I can show you how it's cool to have that back. Background. Oh, you're, um, oh you're, no. <laughs> Hi, Aaron. You're oh. in the now. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, my goodness. There we go. There we go. I, I guess my screensaver went on. <laughs> well, I'm glad you alerted me. I would have been, you would have been bored by that portion of the workshop. <laughs> no. <a> so, <laughs> I'm going to take my, um, my uh, green piece of paper because, again, this is going to help me kind of cheat because I can. Uh, and um, if you remember the flying geese, and so I'm gonna show it to you. So flying geese is this one right here. There, it's actually got four quadrants within the quadrant. Each of these squares has two triangles. So um, essentially what you need to do is just take your square and you're going to, you're going to essentially, I'll just kind of sketch out. Well, I guess I, I guess I should use a ruler because otherwise it will not look, <laughs> it won't look correct. Um, so I'm going to sketch out um, my uh, triangles are going to basically look like this. And um, the way it works is that on this side, the triangles, the only tricky part is you have to keep track of which direction the actual yeah, it's good to watch you doing it. <laughs> yeah, look, watch me and see, like I just messed up there, but you know what's actually cool? Because I'm actually, think of it like this. I'm actually going to freehand this one. This is where you can see that even I cannot draw a straight line. <laughs> but that's actually kind of cool. I actually love, to me, I find um, artwork that's not totally. Uh, I agree. And it's more really true to actual patchwork, right? Yeah. Out of fabric, yeah. And what's cool, so for this purpose, um, and I don't know, I've got all sorts of paper here. Um, let me find a good. So these little triangles, actually, you know, an easy way to do this would be this. I'm kind of learning while I'm talking. If you just um, take your paper, divide, so I'm, I'm just kind of eyeballing it. I'm gonna divide each triangle, and then we're gonna, when possible, double up. Because look, if you double up on two, you can create save your wrists a little bit. And I just created two little patterns. And what's cool is, so now, now remember I talked about using a limited palette um, earlier. Um, if you want your quilt, if you're more concerned about maybe your quilt having that sense of like design and rhythm, then you might want to think about, you know, using limited colors. So maybe limited, um, just a few types of paper or a few types of, um, marker or whatnot because see what you do automatically just by the fact of using the same color i'm creating this rhythm to it um but of course i want to mix it up a little bit just to make it more interesting and also actually you know i'm going to go one step further if you remember in the story of the flying geese one of the one of the patterns was actually um, a different Set of triangles. See, if I really had planned, I could have done four pieces of paper and cut all my triangles at once. But oh. <laughs> that's if, for if you do this workshop a second time, you could you might want to plan ahead. So, but remember, in this case, I want my third or my fourth quadrant. I want the um, triangles, and I'm just kind of eyeballing it. You could you could trace it out or or you know measure it out if you wanted to. Um, but you can have your fourth set because remember the flying geese. We want um, to show 
which direction to go. And so I'm going to make this one yellow. Yeah, very cool. And then you could, if you wanted to, again, you have options. So maybe I want to create a pattern within this, or maybe I want to draw something in here. You could do, you know, little dots, like if you wanted to do polka dots. And again, I love, for me, I think patterns are more interesting if you can kind of have it in different places. Like maybe I do it up here too to kind of keep it a little symmetrical. Um, or maybe what I do is I take one of my, I don't want to take, you could put your bird in there. You could, you know, you could bring in things that you've tied in before. Um, or grab a scrap of um, pattern paper. Like here's my little scrap pages. This might work. And for the other part, you know, I can just go ahead and fill in the gaps. What is the, um, that little pad? Who makes that little pad? That's a very- You know, I got this at um, a craft store. I think I got it either Hobby Lobby or Michael's. It's just, it was like the um, scrap. Yeah. Section. So I bet in Target, I bet you probably even just go online. Um, but if you all look up just like scrapbook uh, materials, I was amazed at like you could get a whole book with like all these patterns. I mean, if you really love doing this, that I would say it would probably be worth doing that. Mm -hmm. uh, or if you have magazines, you could just go through magazines and just find yeah. pages that yeah. are interesting. And one thing I want to show you all, do you remember that like pink underpainting? Well, think of this green as an underpainting and see what I can do. Now, I'm not, I haven't been, I'm not doing a good demo here because you should be gluing these down. <laughs> um, I mean, you might want to leave them loose until you've decided where you want to put them. But see, that's going to happen. They're going to fly all over. But what I love to do is purposely leave this little speck of green because after it's all mm -hmm. filled in, I'm going to have this cool, energetic green everywhere. Um, and I, I just think that creates such a neat sense of, uh, you know, energy. And that is your, yeah, that's that's very much your style. Yep. Thanks yeah. for sharing that little tip with us. Nice. Insider tip. <laughs> Insider tip, exactly. That's what we're here for, to hear the insider yeah. tips from our, from our famous illustrators. <laughs> so how are you guys doing? Are you working? I would love to hear what you're working on. Um, if you have a chance, um, say something in the chat to Claire and maybe she can share what your what you decided to focus on for your patterns, or maybe yeah. you're using an interesting material. Yeah, that's the way we have to sort of uh, communicate because we're not obviously in a live yeah. um, Zoom workshop. So if you could just like put some things in the chat, I know you're probably all busily uh, making your own collages, but if you want to just put in a little message in the chat, what you're creating, or if you have any um, questions that as you're working away that you're thinking about, um, now's a very good time to ask. Oh, Malcolm. Um, he's making a patchwork bird. Oh, that sounds really nice. Excellent. Sounds really fun. Malcolm, hi. <laughs> I, lo I would love to see that. Obviously, I love birds. And it's cool because think about that, like a bird. I mean, you could make it as simple as like, here's my little, actually, look, I just could make another, you could make it as simple as a sparrow, which is just a circle, a triangle, and kind of an, I don't know, an unusual shape here. But it could be a series of, or maybe you challenge yourself. You just cut up a bunch of shapes. Like, look, I've got all these little scraps here now. I've just created these cool little scraps and why not take them and then double them up? So look at that. You can take the smaller triangles yeah. and create these kind of inner triangles. And maybe within each one you have, you know, and if you're someone that likes to write, maybe you put like, you have, a, um, you know, words in here, like words that inspire you or maybe words that symbolize what you're drawing. That would be another really cool way to go about it. And again, make sure you're gluing down at some point because I keep not gluing and everything moves. Um, I am gonna see, I'm, I'm actually in this case, I put the, you know, there's no right or wrong way. So really just, and as I mentioned, I'm not, a, I'm actually not a collage artist. So um, if y'all wanna see real collage artists work, there's some great examples on the Society of Illustrator um, website, which um, so you can see how artists who make their stories, as I mentioned, I, I paint my quilts. So for me, what I'm doing is I'm creating these, um, I'm using paper to mimic what I would typically do with painting. And honestly, it's the same process. I would have taken my little square brush and painted it and then kind of sculpted it out. And um, so it's just a different medium. And it's very fun to collage, you know, even if you're yeah. working in a different medium, um, it's freeing, I think. It's I, therapeutic. I, yeah, it's like the coloring book freeze. <laughs> Oh, Kristen said something really cute. So Kristen says, this is great. And besides thinking I should have named my children, her kids, 
uh, Rose, Farrow, and Magnolia. So she's very inspired by the names too. This is oh, Kristen. I don't know if you know her. <laughs> That's so funny. Yeah, I am. Um, we well because we're both artists. Obviously, we spend a lot of time. Uh, thinking about the names. Um, the only thing that's tricky is they're symbolic, but I can't say that there's like a, a like a family has like, I it would be really cool if there was like a story about, you know, um, I don't know, a story in our, you know, we have to make up the story of their oh, yeah, you, have, you, you make up the story from now, the story yeah, starts. Yeah, I already have to commit to something, but. Yeah, the story starts now. <laughs> are very symbolic I think sparrow you know I love the idea of like um his eyes on the sparrow or there's some really the symbol that um you know no like even the smallest sparrow you know um just so there's so much beautiful um yeah so much so much beauty in a name and it's interesting with names to um actually I'm, as I'm talking yeah. let me do the bow tie pattern while I'm talking um I'm going to do a quick time check. Yeah, we, we, we're rounding up to almost noon soon, but you really packed it in there. And oh my gosh, the amount of information and incredible visuals that you shared and so much we've learned. I can't thank you enough. We've really, really enjoyed having you this morning. It's I been hope this has been amazing. helpful. And I know I spent probably more time talking than, uh, than creating, but as you see with this kind of creative mess, there's a Really, I mean, you just need a few tips that before you, you roll with it. There's no right or wrong way to do it. So I hope that all of you that uh, participated, I hope that you'll, you know, keep working on what you've started um, and know that there's no right or wrong way to do it. Um, it's just about, you know, thinking about what's meaningful to you yeah. and choosing yeah. symbols that can Absolutely. represent that and then cutting it up and gluing it down. But yeah. 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 And you know what, I, I have already got a couple of um, photographs, thank you so much, um, to Toma and Dana. Oh, they good. just uh, sent in pictures of, well, I, I think their dad did, I know. <laughs> but anyway, he's taken some great pictures of them at work, aerial view shots, which I'll share oh, with you. Well, I can't wait to see that, that's awesome. Send in pics, please do, because it's really cool to see. Um, and yeah. you know what's actually been funny about this process is, the Patrick Path, because it, because I illustrated this book, um, again, it was 2005, so it's been 16 years. When I, when I, I Googled it recently because I was trying, I was trying to think of ideas for this workshop. And what's amazing is, is that actually there are a lot of teachers that have already turned this book into um, workshops, and and there were study guides I could find. I found several YouTube videos of people reading the book and then making their own quilts. So it was really cool to see that other people had thought of that before I, before I did, you oh, know, this, so yeah. Cool. And I had no idea that, and in fact, there's, this is actually really cool. Um, uh, a girlfriend of mine, a few years ago, my girlfriend, Stacy texted me because she had been watching a movie. Um, oh, what's the name of the movie with Ethan Hawke. And it has a, my book has a cameo in the movie. It's called, oh. um, well, now I can't think of the name of it. It's Anybody on, know the movie? Oh, it's um, <laughs> oh, it's a one word, and it's by the the director that did Taxi Driver, and um, or oh man, I can't think of. It's um not Redemption, but it's along the lines. But it's a really it's it, but it was cool because in the story that he's a, a preacher, and I'm gonna grab my book here, and um and the book and the church that he's at is an underground railroad stop, and so there's like a little like cameo where they're holding the book and they're talking about it, and um. And so that's kind of neat to see when your book has like another life beyond, yes. you know, yeah. what you imagined, but you know, it's a beautiful yeah. story and it's, it's symbolic and um, it's, I mean, it's timeless. And I think that there's a lot of great takeaways from it. And then just as an artist, obviously we can learn a lot from the idea of telling a story through symbols and getting into somebody else's world. So. Yes, it's been very interesting to hear about all the symbols. I mean, I had a little bit of a, an inkling. I saw a wonderful, quilt exhibit in New York um, a few years ago um, at the Museum of Arts and Crafts. I think it's on 53rd oh, Street. Yeah. It was fantastic. And um, yeah, it, it's just, it's still another art form, you know, and, and it's a way of illustrating with another material. You know, there are so many materials illustrators can use um, yeah. as do artists, artists, you know, obviously sculptors, etc. But um, mm -hmm. with illustrators too, illustrating story is a very key thing for illustrators to do a narrative to, um, yeah, to, to portray something as a story through their art. So you definitely have done that this morning. <laughs> and, <laughs> um, I hope everybody has had a really super time. I know 
I know you have. I know you have, and I know you'll join us again. And I can't wait to see um, you all again for more future Saturday stories. And um, thank you so much, Erin. I wish you a very good weekend ahead. And thanks for joining us. Wonderful. Thank you all for joining. I really appreciate it. Um, find me again, my website's erinbanks.com. So if you wanted to send me a note, you can do that or send it to Claire and the Society of Illustrators. And um, definitely check out the great content. There's so many great videos and um, amazing artists on there. The coloring really pages there too. <laughs> oh, that's right. That's true. We have some coloring pages there too. So, but thank you all for joining and sharing your Saturday morning with us. It was really, I mean, this was really fun. And um, I'm already visualizing what you've been creating. So I hope it was inspiring yeah. for y'all as well. Yeah, actually, everyone's saying it's very inspiring we've got some lovely comments thanks so much take care all right thanks bye y'all